Welcome, everybody. I am Theodore Bale. I'm Assistant Director of Public Programs here at the Menil, and it is wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, recently, I've been telling everybody about this event, and it occurred to me in those conversations that every person I met has some significant relationship to Alexander Calder's work. Certainly, everyone knows who he is. Um, when I was young, I couldn't understand why my parents would not let me climb on the Stegosaurus. It's a very large red sculpture that's installed outdoors in between the Wadsworth Athenaeum and City Hall in Hartford, where I grew up. But, but it, it seemed a, a terrible injustice because it's a, such a great sculpture for a kid to look at and really informed my, my early experiences of art, really wonderful sculpture. <clears throat> Writer and cultural critic Fran Lebowitz said, all artists are critics, but very few critics are artists. Jed Pearl is one of those few. He has the critical imagination to imagine Calder's imagination and the rare ability to engage that of the reader. Mr. Pearl was art critic for the New Republic for 20 years. He's a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books. He is a formidable author. Uh, three previous books are Magicians and Charlatans, Antoine's Alphabet, and New Art City. The latter was a New York Times notable book and an Atlantic Book of the Year. He lives in New York City. Please give him a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here talking about Calder. I was just saying that uh, every time I come back to the Manila, I'm just blown away all over again by what a phenomenal place this is. It really is one of the great museums of the world. Um, and it's a place of serendipity. Uh, I wasn't surprised when I came here that you have a Calder, uh, two acrobats from 1929 that's in the galleries right now. But the really crazy serendipitous thing was when I walked in here about an hour and a half ago, here you have a room full of Ellsworth Kellys. Um, now, Ellsworth Kelly was a generation younger than Alexander Calder, but around the time in the 50s that Ellsworth Kelly was leaving France, he'd lived in France for a number of years and then was coming back to New York, he met Calder, who was living in France. And Calder was very, very impressed by the work that this young man was doing in the 50s. And when, when Ellsworth Kelly went back to New York, I think it's 1956, uh, I may have the year slightly off, uh, Calder, got in touch with Alfred Barr, the director of the Museum of Modern Art, and Dorothy Miller, who was one of the curators there, and he told them to go see Kelly's work. Um, and so he was instrumental in that sense in really kind of jump-starting Kelly's career back in the US. And Calder also paid Kelly's rent for a period of time in New York City when, Calder was, when Kelly was starting out. Um, and this is really uh, one of many cases of the extraordinary gift for friendship. Um, friendships with people, his contemporaries, with people younger, um, that is a wonderful part of the Calder story. It was one of the great pleasures of working on, on this book, uh, so weaving in all these amazing stories, some of which are friendships with people who are enormously famous, Marcel Duchamp, uh, Miro, Mondrian, but he was also a man who had friendships with people he'd known when he was in his 20s that kept going, that were sustained until he was in his 60s and uh, early uh, 70s. Uh, you know, there never has been a biography of Calder. He died in 1976. Um, but this is actually the first biography. And it's been an, a fabulous challenge for me because he is an enormously well-known artist. We all feel we know Calder. So for me, the great question was, uh, can we know Calder in new and different ways? Is there a, are there other sides and aspects of Calder that we can come to understand? And what I want to do this evening um, is talk about focus on really three moments, kind of points in his, in his career, in his life, that I think are particularly telling in terms of, of how this, this biography kind of reveals aspects of him and dynamics in his life and his work that people may not be aware of. Um, 
One of the things that's really fascinated me in doing this uh, biography, and I think it's something that even a lot of biographies of artists don't do that well, um, what's fascinated me is trying not only to tell the story of the life and the, uh, the, of the life lived day by day, and that, that is a fabulous story. It, it's, it's rich in an almost novelistic way, but at the same time, I wanted to try to tell the story of Calder's imaginative life. How does the imagination of a genius evolve? What are the, the things that fertilize a genius? And that's a very mysterious thing because the mind of a genius works in ways that um, defy uh, sometimes kind of logic. And so part of what I'm trying to do in this book is kind of get at the workings of this, this great imagination. Uh, so what I want to do is in the next 25 or so minutes, uh, touch on kind of three moments, one during his childhood, and then one when he turns to abstract art around 1930, and then uh, look finally for, for a kind of third case study at uh, the beginnings of Calder's uh, kinetic work, the beginnings of the mobile in the mid-30s. Um, and then I'd be happy to kind of have a conversation, answer any questions. Uh, any of you might have. You have here on the right a wonderful photograph by an, uh, an Italian ph photographer, Ugo Mulas, who was very active in the 50s and 60s. He photographed a lot of the pop artists. He was Italian, but was in New York in 64, and did this wonderful photograph of Calder in his house in Roxbury, Connecticut, napping. Calder, Calder was a very high energy guy who also loved to nap. Um, and he would fall asleep like at the dinner table, but he was also famous for people would think he was completely out of it. And then he would suddenly open his eyes and say something that made it absolutely clear he had not missed a single instant of the conversation. So here he is napping. And the reason I'm showing this to you right now is if you look at the upper left-hand corner of that uh, photograph of Calder, you'll see uh, the back wall, the painting you see on the left, which is a portrait of Calder as a six-year-old done in 1904, he was born in 1898, by his mother. Calder's mother was a very gifted painter by the name of Nanette Letterer Calder. Letterer was a maiden name, she was from a Jewish family in Milwaukee. Um, Calder came, as many of you know, from a family of artists. His father, Sterling Calder, was an enormously well-known, important sculptor, mostly of public works in the first quarter of the 20th century. His paternal grandfather was also a well-known sculptor who uh, created the hundreds of sculptures on the Philadelphia City Hall. So he comes from this family of artists, and the first thing I want to uh, uh, kind of uh, t t talk about is, uh, talk a little bit about his relationship with that family. You have on the left a photograph of Calder's parents before he was born in Paris in 1895, right before they, uh, just after they got married. Um, and they'd gone off to Paris to be artists together. Uh, very, you, know, you can see Calder's father was a very romantically handsome guy. Um, and on the right, you have a photograph of Calder's mother, Nanette, playing with Calder uh, around 1900. A photograph actually taken, it turns out, and this is something I discovered a number of years ago. It's one of a series of photographs taken by a woman named Eva Watson Schutz, who's actually uh, an important uh, turn of the century American pictorialist photographer who was a friend of, of Nanette Calder. Um, and they were actually involved in a founding a feminist arts organization in Philadelphia in the 1890s. Calder's mother was a, a feminist artist. Uh, so, so he grows up in this, in this, in this family. His father uh, also uses him as a model. On the left, you have a sculpture known as the Man Cub, which is uh, a sculpture of Calder at the age of maybe two or three. And on the right, you have an enormous fountain called the Fountain of Energy that Calder's father did for the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco in 1915. Uh, Calder uh, lived in, as a boy, actually, in both in Southern California and the Bay Area. Now, there has been a myth that has grown up over the years, and this is the first thing I want to focus on, that Calder's parents were sort of conservative, sort of old-fashioned artists, and that their son was this kind of renegade who they didn't understand, and 
uh, that they, there's kind of a myth that's developed that they, in fact, didn't encourage him to be an artist. And this is completely wrong, okay? Calder's parents' art, when we look at it today, it looks um, uh, maybe not avant-garde to us, but rear-guard. But they saw themselves, his parents, when they met uh, in Philadelphia in the 1880s and got married in the 1890s, they saw themselves as radical artists, as modernists, as modern artists. They were close friends with people like John Sloan, um, Robert Henry, the artists who became the Ashcan School and painted New York, and so the realities of New York in the early 20th century. They saw themselves as very progressive artists. They were interested in Manet and Impressionism. Um, Calder's father was a great admirer of Rodin. And, and when you start to understand this, you begin to learn something and understanding something really fascinating about the beginnings of Calder's imaginative life. Um, and so Calder's father got tuberculosis he, he, um, in 1905, 1906, and I won't get you the whole story, but they end up living for a time in Southern California, in Pasadena, and you see the family, Calder, his sister, who's two years older than him, Peggy, mother and father in Pasadena, right around 1908. They, go, they live in Pasadena for a few years because the climate is, is better as he's, than the East, so people felt, as he's recovering. And Calder, in 1909, does these little metal sculptures. They're tiny as gifts for his parents. They're done in cheek brass, okay? And this has always been known. In fact, one of these little sculptures, Calder thought it was so important that when he had his first retrospective of the Museum of Modern Art in 1943, one of these, the, the, the sculpture of the dog on the left, there's the dog and a dog, the dog was, was um, in that show. It was the beginning of his retrospective. And this is, everybody's always known this. And I, I didn't really know that much about Pasadena in those years, but I started to look into it. And it turns out, some of you probably know this, Pasadena was one of the centers of the arts and crafts movement in America. And it turns out that Calder's parents were friends with everybody in the arts and crafts movement. And I show you on the left um, some, some metal things by a guy named Donald Donaldson, D I'm sorry, uh, uh, Douglas Donaldson, um, a, on the top a, uh, uh, a, streets, uh, a street number for a house that he was involved with, a lamp in the middle, and then um, on the bottom is a, an arts and crafts, a page from an arts and crafts manual about how to make lamps. Um, and I began to realize that this little boy, called her at the time he makes these things, is maybe 10 or 11 years old. I began to realize, how did this happen? Well, Calder was living in this family where Everybody around them were doing these, the metal work. Um, and I actually think it's possible, we can never prove it, that Calder actually got some tips as a 10-year-old, very bright, precocious, creative 10-year-old, from this man, Douglas Donaldson. And when you start to think about this, um, uh, it starts to expand the imagination. On the left, I'm showing you a, an arts and crafts watch fob made around 1900. Okay, uh, made in actually Massachusetts. On the right are pieces of jewelry by Alexander Calder, made in the third, 1930s and 40s. Now, the arts and crafts movement, what was the arts and crafts movement? It starts in, in, in England with Ruskin and William Morris, and it was the, the idea of the arts and crafts movement was to get away from the industrial, d impersonal object, to get back to the handmade, the artisanal, um, the, and there were a lot of ideas about um, the, the kind of the kind of fundamental inspiration that was in the nature of the child. It was a very romantic idea. And this was an environment in which Calder came of age. Um, and, and the more you think about this, the more I have begun to believe that you can regard Calder, his entire career, as a kind of fulfillment in America, the final kind of flowering of this impulse in the arts and crafts movement to, to make things by hand, to find shapes and the meaning of shapes in this, in this very immediate encounter with materials. When I was 
working on, you know, kind of tr teaching myself about the Arsene Crafts movement in Pasadena, I came across um, this doorway on the left, which is the doorway uh, to a, 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 a house called, which is called El Alisal, which is in Pasadena, um, which was designed and built um, by a man named Charles Loomis, uh, who was uh, pioneered a lot of the interest in um, Native American arts and crafts and culture. He was a friend of the Calders, of, of Calder's parents. Um, and do you see on the upper left on that doorway um, the, that wrought iron design, okay, on the upper left, which is by a guy named Maynard Dixon. When I saw that, I thought, oh my God. Now here on the right is a napkin holder, uh, napkin ring that Calder did about 40 years later. But there's every reason to believe that Calder saw that doorway as a 10 year old boy. And actually, this is one of these things where I, 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 saw, I found this like, I don't know, in the middle of the night, I was at my place in the country in upstate New York. And I've been working a lot, on a lot of this with uh, the Calder family and there's a grandson the youngest of the four grand, called, called her grandchildren, a man named Sandy Rower, who runs the Calder Foundation. And I sent him in the middle of the night that image on the left. And I said, well, we can't be absolutely sure your grandfather saw this, but isn't this interesting? And he wrote me back and said, this is unbelievable, okay? And, but it's not just, um, it's, it's not just those connections, but when you start to think about Calder's, the trajectory of his career, the photograph on the right is of the kitchen in the Roxbury house, the Calder house in Connecticut, with all these kitchen implements he made by hand. On the left, a couple of necklaces he made for his wife, Louisa. These things done in the 30s and 40s are a kind of extension of the ideas of the, of the arts and crafts movement. And if you begin to think about it this way, really so much of Calder's art, again, the, the imaginative use of simple materials, um, as in this wonderful sculpture, uh, wire sculpture of Josephine Baker, or as you're in your two acrobats, that's right here uh, down the hallway, and even going as far as these are late mature Calders. This is a work from on the right, Eucalyptus, a great mobile from 1940. And on the left, you have an installation shot of a Calder show at the Pierre Matisse Gallery in New York in 1940. But in a sense, um, the whole career can be seen as kind of flowing out of this initial contact with the arts and crafts movement. And, and I, I, don't, I don't want to go you know, get too deep in the weeds here, but it also is, it's very interesting, I think, in helping us understand um, the ease with which Calder assimilated a lot of modern ideas when he moved to Europe in the late 1920s. Um, because those of you who know your art history know the arts and crafts movement internationally is regarded as one of the sort of foundations of modernism. For instance, the Bauhaus in Germany um, had its origins in the ideas of the arts and crafts movement. So at Calder, this was like literally mother's milk to him, okay? So, and this is something nobody had ever seen before. There was this myth that Calder's parents were these kind of fuddy-duddy, dusty old-fashioned artists, and then it turns out they were, they were in their own way modernists. And indeed, they understood what he was doing. I mean, you, you have Calder's parents saying later on when he's doing these abstractions, they say, well, it's not at the art we would do, but they understood exactly what he was up to. They, they understood what formalism was, they understood um, the idea of, 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 of the expressive power of abstract form. That was stuff that he learned about, in a sense, uh, at, at the heart, you know, from his parents. Now, the second um, uh, kind of place I want to kind of dip into for a few, for a few minutes um, is the moment in 1930, 31, when Calder becomes an abstract artist. Um, Calder, Calder's first renown not renowned in the sense we talk today about Jeff Koons being famous, but his renown in a circle of artists was doing these wire figure sculptures, like the one on the left, which is the Brass family, which is in the Whitney Museum, like the one you have on exhibit here of two acrobats. And he started doing these 
1927, and from 1927 to 1929, the work here, Brass Family is 1929, the one you have in the gallery is 1929 as well. He did for three or four years these extraordinarily witty, um, uh, sinuous um, sculptures of acrobats. He did a series of heads of friends of his. Um, he did performers. He, there's a head of Jimmy Durante. He was basically responding to um, uh, the, the kind of theater the, in the broad sense of the late 1920s. And of course, the late 1920s, this is uh, the Roaring Twenties. Calder arrives in Paris in 26, which is kind of the climax of the rage for the Charleston. Calder loved to dance. Um, and the sculpture of the late 20s, this first group of sculptures he does, is, I, I believe, is really one of a kind of a quintessence, quintessential statements of that spirit, the, that crazy, slightly delirious optimism of the late 20s. You, you, experience, you find it in, in F. Scott Fitzgerald's novels, which come out of the same uh, kind of atmosphere. And then suddenly, in 1930, uh, 31, Calder is doing these extraordinarily austere things like the work you see on the right. This is a work from his first um, abstract show, show of abstract work in London, which you see here. And actually, when, when he had this show, um, the Gallery Percier in 1931, they hung at the top of the gallery some of these wire heads that he'd been doing in, since 1928, 29, 30. And then on this low platform around were these abstractions, which he was doing, he started doing um, he did most of them in early in 1931, which were among the most radical, radically reduced minimalist sculptures that had been done anywhere, anywhere in the world at that time. And so the, the question comes up, well, how does this happen? Okay, how does an artist go from one kind of work uh, you know, from, from the kind of work on the left to the kind of work on the right. There are obviously similarities, the sense of the, the, draw, the, the wires drawing in spaces, there's a connection, but there's a very dramatic difference. Okay. How do you explain this? Well, one way it has always been explained, or, and, and this goes back to Calder himself who talked about this was. In 1930, uh, 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 Calder, as you know, most of you know, Calder had a kind of uh, a small toy uh, circus that he often performed. I'll show you a bit of that in a minute. Um, Calder would give these little performances of his, of his circus for select groups of people. Now, many of you have probably seen the Calder Circus at the Whitney Museum in, in New York. Um, but the fact is, up until the 1960s, it was never exhibited in a museum. You had to go to a performance of it, which were generally done in an intimate setting. So he had these performances, and a friend of his in 19, early, in the fall of 1930, um, suggested he invite a number of sort of leading lights in the Parisian avant-garde. Um, the, uh, uh, the painter Leger came, uh, a very important art critic by the name of Carl Einstein came, um, and Montreon came to one of these performances. And a friend of Calder's who was, lived, they lived together in a place called Villa Brune, um, uh, went so talk to Mondron at the at this circus event. Calder said afterwards he was so busy getting the second act ready that he didn't get a chance to talk to anybody. But this friend uh, of of Calder's went to visit Mondrian's studio, and Mondrian's studio was a kind of legendary place among the avant-garde. Again, a small group of people. We're talking about a few hundred people who knew who Mondrian was. Mondrian was not famous in, you know, in the way we think of fame today. But he had this studio which was very, very unusual. You came into a very dark room, which was his bedroom, and then you walked up a staircase, and you came into a, a very bright room with light coming from two sides. You see Mondrian in that studio on the left in 930. And not only were there paintings, but Mondrian had arranged um, rectangles of color, paper, on the wall. And people who came, it was like going into some kind of alternate world where, of, where pure form had kind of taken over the entire environment. And 
and, and Calder's friend, uh, this is a guy by the name of Bing Einstein, came back from seeing the studio and said, it's amazing. Calder decided he was going to go. And he went to Mondrian's studio, and he said years later, he said, it was like the... It was like when a baby is born and it, hasn't, it doesn't cry immediately and they give it a slap and then it cries. He said, going to Mondrian's studio was like the slap that woke me up as an abstract artist. Calder, I believe, had known, had seen a lot of abstract artist, art before, but he had never felt it emotionally. He said he went into Mondrian's studio and saw paintings like the one on the right. But it was the whole environment, this environment where the whole room painted white with like, you know, one piece of furniture would be painting black, another red. It was, it was this entire environment made Mondrian, made Calder suddenly realize, I see what abstract art is and I can do this. So that's one of the explanations um, for how did this happen, okay? But to me, you know, I don't know if that's enough to explain this dramatic change in his work. Um, and so people struggle uh, with this. Um, now, another thing that happens right around this time, um, Mondrian uh, called Calder, he's always going back and forth between Paris and New York. He'll be in Paris for six months or a year and they'll go back to New York um, and then he'll go back to Paris. He's on a boat in 1929 going back from France to America and he meets a woman, the woman on the left, a woman by the name of Louisa James. She's a great niece of Henry James, the novelist. She's from a, a, a wealthy, a Boston Brahmin family, but a very unconventional Boston Brahmin family. Her father is a kind of wacky leftist, actually. And she's been in Paris, and her father, she's actually, she's in her mid-20s, she's unchaperoned in Paris. Her father has been, he's obsessed with the League of Nations and the hope of, of preventing war again. And he's been in Geneva. And she meets Calder. I mean, she's kind of, she's a kind of, she's, from this very proper family, but she's had, she's something of a bohemian already, I now believe, when she meets Calder. And uh, on this boat, a great romance begins. They're, they're not married until the very beginning of 31, but um, actually in the fall of 1930, when, when Calder makes his visit to Mondrian's studio, Louisa is in Paris, and it's, it's very funny, she's, there, there, there are tons of letters, family letters that exist to this day, but there's about a month when she's in Paris with Calder where there's radio silence. Nothing exists, whether there are letters that are destroyed or she just, she's in, she goes to Europe to, to see him. She's in England and she's writing to her mother like every day and then there's a letter saying, I'm getting on a plane and going to Paris tomorrow and then suddenly there's silence. Um, so they're having this great romance, and then they, they marry at the beginning of 31. And many people have talked about what is the implication of, of this for the change in Calder's work. Um, now, she, one thing is, and some people said, including Calder's sister, well, he always was worrying about how to make a living. And he was beginning to hope in the late 20s that his wire sculptures of funny wire sculptures of acrobats would sell, though they never sold very well. Um, but she has a monthly check from her family. She has a trust fund. And people said, well, he could then just do whatever he wanted. He, he could do sculpture um, uh, like, uh, I, I should just say, the, on the right, you have a wire head that he did of her, of, uh, of, of Louisa in 19, uh, probably 1930, we're not exactly sure. But you know, some people said, well, once there was money coming in from her family, then he could do these strange abstract sculptures that, that had no chance of selling. Um, and, you know, that may be an element, just as Mondrian, the visit to Mondrian's studio is an element in this transformation's work. Another thing that has always struck me as interesting, he said to a, a close friend in around 1930, who was saying, well, who, he was asking, this friend was asking Calder about Louisa, this woman he's been married, and he said, what does she do? Who is she? And Calder said, she's a philosopher. Okay. And interestingly enough, I found um, she was actually reading Plato's, the, the, Platon, the uh, Socratic dialogues of Plato 
a couple of years before she met Calder. So she was, she was, Calder was a very kind of ebullient, uh, let's have a party person. She loved a party too, but she was a more pensive, contemplative kind of person. And he's, and I say in the book that I think she became the philosopher of his art. And I think her philosophic or more contemplative nature may also have accounted for the move from these very witty uh, figures to this kind of, uh, this slower, uh, in some sense, more um, indirect kind of expression that you have in the abstractions. But there was an another thing that came uh, to occur to me, began to occur to me as I thought about all this. And on the left again, you have one of these wonderful figure sculptures. This is from 29 called The Shot Putter. On the right, you have a sculpture called Musique de Varese. Varese was a, an avant-garde composer who was a good friend of Calder's. This is a work, um, again, from the early 30s. Um, and I began to think about this moment when this happens, when Calder shifts from these figures to these abstractions. Okay, we've seen how okay, there's a visit to Mondrian's studio, there's whatever this, the, the, um, the, the love affair and the marriage with Louisa has to do with this, whether you have just the nitty gritty economics of it or something more philosophical. But then I start to think, broaden the perspective, and this is one of the things I try to do in the book, see both the immediate things that are happening in somebody's life, but also the broader things that may, may impact. And let's think about this. Through. What happens in the world between 1929? What happens in 1929? The crash. And, 19, and this is the beginning of the Great Depression. Okay, And I began to think that the sculpture that Calder had done in the late 20s, these witty figures, he couldn't keep doing them. That world, that world of a kind of crazy optimism, uh, feverish optimism, was gone. And I think that another, again, I'm not, you know, inspiration for genius is not one thing or another, it's multiple things. And I think the coming of the Depression was one of those things. And. Uh, in, that, in that connection, it's interesting uh, to think about um, a novel that uh, uh, people uh, who, who think about Calder a lot often talk about. There's a novel by Tom, Thomas Wolfe called You Can't Go Home Again. Some of you may have read at some point when you were young. Or, um, and in that novel, um, and you, uh, there's a scene in which that takes place in the in the apartment on you know, in the Upper East Side of New York of a very wealthy woman, um, in which a man by the name of Piggy Logan, Piggy Logan, performs a miniature circus. Okay, and Piggy Logan is in, is Alexander Calder, and indeed Thomas Wolfe was in 1929, right as the Depression was hitting, at a performance, which in the Upper East Side apartment of his secret lover, as it happens, a woman named Eline Bernstein, who was a, a theatrical designer. And in this novel, You Can't Go Home Again, um, Thomas Wolfe, who Thomas Wolfe was one of these, he was a kind of, uh, you know, very leftist, um, uh, you know, the rich are destroying everything and, uh, uh, kind of person, and he, he takes the Calder Circus, and, and it is the symbol of decadence, somehow, of this kind of ridiculous decadence of the late 1920s. And in the Calder family, if you mention this novel by Thomas Wolfe, even today, they spit at you, you know? Um, but I thought it was very interesting, because um, I think um, it tells us something about, about what Calder's work, I mean, I don't think the work of the ninth, late 1920s, Calder's work is, is decadent, but it does reflect a mood of that period. And, and Thomas Wolfe would not have liked the, the work Calder went on to do, these abstractions. Thomas Wolfe would not, Thomas Wolfe was like, you know, he would have been for social realism, let's do paintings of struggling workers. That was the kind, the way he would think. But Calder sensed that his late 20s work was part of that moment, and I think, um, and again, it's just, it's, it's part of the sort of larger landscape of his art, that the, the, the broader shifts, social and economic shift, affected um, the change in his work. Finally, just um, briefly, I want, I want to kind of 
uh, talk about this, the whole question of how does Calder come to be the creator of the mobile, okay? And there had been a little bit of kinetic art done before Calder. There are people, Maholi Naj, Noam Gabo, there are a few people who do Duchamp, who do things that actually move, okay? But no artist of the 20th century, uh, sorry, of the, of the second quarter of the 20th century embraces the idea of movement with the completeness that Calder does. And I think, um, I don't think there's actually an artist in the 20th century who, um, uh, who kind of goes as far in as many directions with the idea of the kinetic Nobody does it more profoundly and thoroughly than Calder. Though I have to say, you're, I mean, when I was in the Mona Hatoum show today, I mean, there you see connections to some of these called various kinds of Calder ideas. I mean, Calder's um, echoes are seen many places. But so, how does Calder become the inventor of Mobile? And again, there are many. It's it's not a question of one thing that happens. It's multiple. The circus, which, uh, which I'm showing you a couple of scenes from the circus on the left, the whole idea of theater and performance, um, things that move. Um, uh, the, the, the circus was, when in its, its early days, people talked about it as a kind of puppet show or marionette show. And the idea of uh, this you know, sc small sculptural element that then is put into movement. Um, the, uh, the, the bareback, the rider, on, you know, the, 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 the cowboy who lassoes um, something. Uh, the, 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 there are scenes in the uh, uh, circus with, with acrobats, and he would, you know, he would manipulate the acrobats, and they would do acrobatic acts. So, so the idea of movement is there, not as, a scu as an idea in sculpture, but as a kind of idea that's an, as, as a kind of theatrical idea, which fascinates him. And indeed, theater was a fascination of Calder's throughout his life. Um, on the right is a, is a sculpture um, uh, from 1931. And, um, and one of the things Calder said at various points was another thing that got him going on movement was he said when he started doing the abstractions, sometimes he wasn't sure exactly how they should be how the angle of something would be. And, and he said, you know, I decided I would leave certain elements um, flexible because who was I to decide what perfection was? So there was also an idea of, um, of sort of creating something that was, that was not sort of the definitive way it was, but leaving that kind of, uh, that, that option of a change or a difference. Um, and in 32, um, he, he has this first show um, in 1932 of Mobiles. Um, and and the, 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 the title of the name Mobiles is actually given to him by Marcel Duchamp, who looks at the work on the right, um, which, is a, uh, which he saw in Calder's studio in Paris. And Calder said, what should I call them? And, and Duchamp said, call them mobiles. Um, uh, but how this comes about, um, and I, I, I spend a, a long time on this in the book, it's, it's a fascinating question. I don't think there's any ultimate answer. But it, it goes to things as immediate as Calder's own physicality. Calder, um, you see him on the left at, at this Stevens Institute of Technology where he, uh, he got his uh, bachelor's degree. Um, on the lacrosse team, he, he loved athletics. He was a dreadful, a terrible athlete, terrible, but he loved athletics, okay? He loved just running around. He loved physicality. He was, an, he was a passionate, though very unconventional dancer. On the right, you have um, a scene at a friend's house in the mid-30s. Um, his wife, Louisa, on the right, she, she loved to play the accordion, and there's uh, Calder on the left with a friend of theirs, you know, kicking, literally kicking up his heels. Um, so physicality um, was a very big thing for him. Uh, the stories I've been told by people who are now my age, who were kids, um, in the 50s, uh, whose parents were friends of the Calders in Connecticut, people would tell me about um, the, go, their, fam, you know, their parents going to like a New Year's Eve party at the Calders and the kids are sent up to go to sleep and a kid wandering down at three in the morning waking up and these adults are like throwing each other practically literally across the, the living room, the, you know, wild dancing. Um, 
So there's a passion for physicality that is that is that that is is immediate in Calder. It's also very interesting. Um, Calder uh, was a passionate cyclist, bicycler in Paris in the early uh, in the early in his early years, in the late uh, uh, 20s, um, he, uh, he uh, there, are, there are newspaper accounts of Calder in his crazy outfits. He loved wearing, you know, brightly colored clothes, dry, riding around Paris on his bicycle. Okay, well, that's a kind of charming thing. Um, and on the left, you have a painting of a bicycle race that he did in New York before he went to Paris. Uh, this is a painting from 1924. And on... On the right, you have a, a blurry video of a film clip, rather, from uh, in 1968, when Calder was uh, 70. Uh, he did at the Rome Opera House what he called a ballet without dancers. Um, and in one of the scenes, cyclists come on stage. Um, and he said to somebody that this ballet with dancers, he said, I should have called it my life in 19 minutes. So he has this thing about cycling. Okay, and again, I thought that's interesting. And you, know, you think about a bicycle is, um, you know, you think about a bicycle and a mobile, hmm, you know. And then I, I, I noticed, um, it's a whole thing about, about bicycles um, in, in that period. Duchamp's first ready-made was a bicycle wheel. Uh, Baccioni's uh, dynamism uh, of a cyclist, 1913, and and there was, there was fiction written about bicycles. There's a, there's a novel by um, Alfred Jarry called Days and Nights in which there's a guy named uh, Sengla. And Sengla rides around um, on this machine with gears. Uh, he whisks up forms and colors as fast as possible with a rapid suction as he whirls along roads and bicycle tracks. Um, and then Jarry says of the bicycle, it's a skeleton exterior to himself, to the rider. And you read this, you think, well, is this part of the sort of background of, uh, of the mobile? Okay, this whole, there's a kind of cult of the bicycle, this mechanism which moves. Um, and I think, again, it's part of the kind of, the ambience out of which um, the, the, the mobile uh, Emerges and finally, again, I, I just I'm kind of offering you these kind of fr fragmented things. Um, there was a whole fascination in Paris in the late 20s and early 30s with dimensions beyond the third dimension, the fourth dimension. There was a Russian kind of crazy mystic guy named Uspensky, who was very popular in the circles Calder moved in, uh, who wrote about um, spirals as leading you from the third to the fourth to the fifth to the sixth to the seventh dimension. And Calder's great friend Verez, the composer Verez, who you see in the left, was also very interested in this. And there are a couple of times where I believe Calder did talk about the fourth dimension. I mean, many people believed that the fourth dimension was indeed time. Other people believed it was another dimension of space. Duchamp was very interested in all this. But if you think of the mobile, isn't the mobile a sculpture that's taken into the fourth dimension of time? Um, so again, these are, I, I, mean, I think, to explain the mobile, how this genius discovers this, you need to go from everything from the man's pleasure in social dancing to these kind of big metaphysical um, ideas. Um, and I think you really need all of that to begin to enable you to, to understand uh, uh, the power of something. This is an incredible mobile vertical foliage from, I think it's 1940-41. Um, but somehow all of that, I think, flows into and then is somehow crystallized, distilled in in, in, in these mobiles, and there are, there are many different kinds of mobiles which Calder then makes really for the rest of his life. I mean, that's really what I wanted to say, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions anybody might have. Thank you. I have a mic here if anybody has questions. Just raise your hand. Um, what led you to Calder? Were you looking for a subject to 
what led me to call them. Yeah, yeah, apart from the fact well, that... Well, it's, it's a funny story. I had always... Um, I've never written a biography. Um, I always sort of... Every book I write is sort of a different kind of book. And I'd always thought, if I ever wrote a biography, the person I really would love to do is Calder. Um, I love the fact that the life moves between two continents, that I'm, it, I'm very interested in both the New York and Parisian art worlds, and he was part of both of them. I love that idea. I'm also really interested in the idea of this avant-garde, this vanguard artist in the 30s, who, while never abandoning or betraying his avant-garde spirit and essence, becomes so enormously uh, famous and beloved among a wide range of people. So it's very interested in that kind of high-low dimension. But I always assumed, because there had never been a biography, that either somebody had been working on one for 30 years, or else um, the family or whoever, I didn't even know whether there was a family or whatever, somebody had somehow been preventing it. And then about a decade ago, um, somebody asked me to do a, I ended up sort of agreeing to do a very small project about Calder. And before I signed the contract, I told everybody, look, I don't even know, is there a foundation? Who's in, I don't want to get involved in this until I've talked to whoever there is. I ended up uh, uh, having a meeting with this uh, man named Sandy Rower, who's the youngest of the four Calder grandchildren who runs the extraordinary Calder Foundation. And uh, uh, he said to me, why are you doing this? Why don't you do a really big book? And I said, I've always assumed, you know. And any, uh, it, it, it turned out that um, in, I, for all kinds of reasons, they had for many years uh, turned down a lot of uh, approaches from biographers. Um, and he and I came to a meeting of minds. He had very much liked something I'd written a decade earlier about Calder. Um, and I have to say, I embarked on the project very nervously because I'd never done a book or project where there was a kind of family foundation kind of relationship. And when I started, I told my editor, look, I'm going to do the work on this for a year, but I don't know if it's going to work out. And as it turned out, um, uh, it's, it's just been an extraordinary, a wonderful experience. And Calder had two daughters. The younger one, unfortunately, died of cancer toward the beginning of my work on this, but the, the older daughter, Sandra Davidson, has been also an extraordinary um, friend and collaborator on this and really given me insights into her parents. Um, but that's, that's sort of how it, it came about, and it's just been a, uh, an absolutely wonderful adventure, which isn't, is not over yet, because this is the first of two volumes. This takes you to the middle of his life. So volume two will come out in 2019. Yep, I'm sorry, did I not really fully? No, I want to talk about the Braniff Airlines. I mean, you the, talk, all the connection, you kind of make sense now, what you're telling me about right. the movement and dimensions. Well, there are, I mean, in a funny way, um, I mean, volume one was sort of about telling about a Calder nobody knew. And volume two is about showing that the Calder everybody thinks they know is not quite the person um, uh, who we think he was. And one of the things I, I'll say very briefly, we all think, you know, big abstract sculpture in public places we now think of as being like, oh yeah, right, you know, like, oh, there's a big abstract sculpture outside. In the mid-1950s, this had not been done in America. And Calder was a real pioneer. And there were actually big civic fights, even in New York City, about putting abstract art out of doors in public. Um, so Calder was I mean, involved in the whole sort of transformation of abstract art and vanguard art into this very public thing. And the Braniff Airlines thing is, a, uh, as, as some of you know, Calder painted some planes for Braniff. Um, uh, in the last decade or so of his life. And it's a great story because Calder and his wife, um, they were always some liberal Democrats, but in the years of Johnson and Nixon and the war in Vietnam, they became increasingly active in the anti-war movement. And the Braniffs were Republicans and friends of Nixon. And um, there are just hilarious things about, I mean, Calder's wife was like freaking out basically about this whole <laughs> thing. I mean, there, there, there are great stories there, but that's volume two. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> well. <laughs> hey, thank you, thank Mr. Pearl. He'll sign books up front. <laughs> <laughs>